What happened here? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Could ask him. All right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so they should be able to hear us, which is good. Um, is has have you got, hey guys, <laughs> have you guys got, um, have you got a camera on you? I just see the Oh, it's up to me. Yeah. Thanks. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, we're good to go. Um, I just want to get a, a good recording. So. How do you. Oh, whatever. That works, I reckon. <laughs> You're gonna have that honey bar. Oh, is that is that short? Oh. Are you on F Lux by any chance? Yeah. Can I turn you F Lux? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Can yeah. Tell yeah, yeah. Um, so hey guys. Um, so just before we get started in about, about a minute, uh, this is Pat. Pat is wonderful, and he is presenting your <laughs> renal revision lecture. Um, so you guys just heard from DPM. Uh, so we're, we've got an arrangement with them that uh, they've, well, in return for being able to speak with you, uh, we'll hopefully be able to cater the next revision lecture day, which is on the 29th. Um, you'll be getting uh, GI and endocrine on that day. So Will's busy organizing. Um, and so we will almost definitely have pizza, uh, which will be good. Um, thanks to, I suppose. Um, we're just making sure. So these are all live streamed and recorded uh, because not everyone can make it. And so you'll have something to go back to to revise. Um, does it work? Okay, cool. So we're all ready to go. Great. Thanks, Kevin. <clears throat> what did I just do? God. <clears throat> uh, all right, so is this about everyone who's going to turn up? Because um, we might get started then. Um, so, yeah, my name's Patrick. I'm one of the third years. I'm at um, Monash Medical Center this year. Um, and today we'll be going over nephrology. So um, just some acknowledgements, um, a lot of my notes are from past revision lectures and VESPA notes and um, random textbooks and stuff. Cool. So um, in terms of the renal content for your end of SEM, so this is last year's end of SEM, um, you can see the majority of the marks come from physiology. So that's where you guys should be focusing on for your revision and what I'll be focusing on for today's talk. Um, but we'll go over some renal anatomy. Um, mostly fears and a little bit of pharmacology and finishing up with some pathology and clinical skills. Okay, um, so um, as an overview, um, the kidneys are bilateral re uh, retroperitoneal structures. Um, it's important to know where they extend from. So the left kidney is from T12 to L3, whereas the right kidney extends from L1 to L4. And does anyone know why the right kidney is slightly lower than the left kidney? Yeah, because the liver is sitting above the right one. Um, so the arterial supply comes from the renal arteries, venous drainage via, via the renal veins, and don't really need to know too much about the innovation. Um, so the ureters are these muscular tubes that um, connect the renal pelvis to the bladder. They insert into the posterior wall of, uh, wall of the bladder at the trigone, and they just carry urine from the kidneys down to the bladder. Um, and they composed of smooth muscle, so they actually have a peristaltic action. Now the ureters have three um, constrictions along the way. There's a constriction at the pelvis, like up here. Um, there's one at the pelvic rim, and there's one at the vesica ureteric junction. So it's important to remember those three points of constriction, because that's where your um, ureteric stones are most likely to be obstructed. Um, now, because of the peristaltic action of the ureters, when you have an obstruction at one of those points, 
um, the ureters are going to try and push urine through. So that's going to be responsible for the renal colic type pain that you get with um, a kidney stone. Um, so the kidneys, um, they have this hilum here, much like the hyla in the lungs. Um, it's the exit point of the ureters, entrance and exit of the renal artery and um, renal vein. Now the kidneys are made up of a cortex, which is this bit around the outside, and these medullary pyramids over here. Um, the medulla is where your filtration occurs, and as a result, that's where 90% of the blood goes. The uh, medulla is responsible for concentration of urine. So um, some of your uh, nephrons are going to have long loops of Henle, which dive deep into the medulla, and um, concentration is going to occur there. Um, does anyone know what type of nephrons are going to have that sort of loops of Henle? Yeah, so I'm hearing uh, Jackson medullary. Good. So uh, just a slide about kidney vasculature. It's not super important, um, not very high yield. So the nephron, um, it's the functional unit of the kidney. You start off with about a million at birth and you lose them over your lifetime. They're made up of the renal corpuscle, which is responsible for filtration of blood and the tubules, um, which are responsible for reabsorption and secretion as well as concentration of urine. There's two types of nephrons. There's the cortical nephrons, which are the ones on the left, um, and as said previously, they have um, shorter loops of Henle that don't dive deep into the medulla, and they make up 70 to 80% of your nephrons. The, um, and they also have these uh, peritubular capillaries. So things that are bolded are important kind of buzzword things to remember. The juxtamedullary nephrons, on the other hand, um, they have long loops of Henle which dive deep into the medulla, and that's how urine is concentrated. So these ones have um, vasa recta instead of the peritubular capillaries. Um, so the, the peritubular capillaries and the vasa recta are um, those after the afferent arteria. The afferent arteria. Um, so your urinephorous tubule is kind of another name for the nephron. It's made up of the corpuscle and the tubules. Um, so know the order of the tubules from proximal convoluted tubule to the loops of Henle, um, the distal convoluted tubule, and finally the collecting tubules, which drain into the calluses and then the ureters. So the renal corpuscle is um, made up of this image over here. Um, so it's got the glomerulus, um, which are these um, spaces over here, um, as well as Bowman's capsule, which is the surrounding a uh, bit over here, and it's made up of the glomerular filtration barrier, which the filtrate has to pass through. The glomerulus has, um, because it's a capillary, it has endothelial cells. It also has mesangial cells, which are kind of like the extracellular matrix. Um, it's also composed of smooth muscle. Um, and it also has these podocyte things. Um, my mouse isn't really working. Um, but they're these things on the outside, and they act as part of the filtration barrier. So the glomerular filtration barrier is made up of three components. Um, you've got the fenestrated capillary endothelium, then the glomerular basement membrane, and finally the epithelial surface with podocytes. And the filtrate passes in the gaps between the podocytes, known as slit diaphragms. So onto embryology. Um, so the kidneys kind of have three um, predecessors before they become your adult kidney, the pronephroi, the mesonephroi, and the metanephroi. Um, not super important, just know that the pronephroi is transient, it has no excretory capacity, and um, as you develop, your kidneys gain more um, capacity to excrete urine, uh, which kind of makes sense. So the metanephroi is made up of the ureteric bud and the metanephric mesoderm. The ureteric bud, as the name suggests, gives rise to the ureters and everything to do with draining of urine. So that's the collecting ducts, the calluses, the pelvis, and the ureter. The metanephric mesenchyme gives rise, as the name suggests, to everything to do with the nephron, so the nephron and the interstitium. Um, and the way that they grow is by reciprocal induction. So the ureteric bud induces nephrogenesis of the metanephric mesenchyme, and the metanephric mesenchyme induces uh, branching morphogenesis of the ureteric buds. Um, so 
Yeah, next slide is about Kakut, which is your congenital um, uh, disorders of the kidney. Um, not super high yield either, but I just included a diagram. Okay, um, so I've got a few questions. Um, which of the following is false? Um, a, the right renal artery is posterior to the IVC. B, the kidney is supplied by only one artery each. C, the adrenal glands are directly on the kidneys. And D, the left renal vein goes under the um, superior mesenteric artery. E, the renal arteries come off the aorta distal to the origin of the superior mesenteric arteries. Um, does someone want to shout out an answer? Um, so the answer is D. Um, I think I might have made a mistake there because that's actually true. Yeah, so the left renal vein does go under the SMA as the picture demonstrates. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so next one. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, yes. <laughs> Okay, um, so which of the following is correct? A, the human kidney, most nephrons are juxtamedullary nephrons. B, the glomeruli of juxtamedullary nephrons are in the renal medulla. And C, the cortical nephrons have long loops of Henle. D, vasa recta are associated with cortical nephrons. And E, all glomeruli are found in the renal cortex. I'm hearing C and E. Yeah, so E is the right one. Um, glomeruli are, are found in the... Uh, renal cortex. Cool. Um, so next one. Um, a patient presents to ED with right loin to groin pain radiating to the back that is colicky and at times very intense. An ultrasound is performed and this shows that the pain is formed from a urinary calculus obstructing the ureter. Uh, where's the calculus most likely located? So do you want to have an answer to this one? <laughs> uh, so I'm hearing like E, I think. Yeah, so E, pelvic brim. Um, so the pelvic brim is also where um, the common iliac branches into its two parts. Um, so it's just got two names for um, the same thing. So make sure you, you know the two names. Okay, I think this is the last anatomy question. So which of the following relating to the surface anatomy of the kidney is correct? A, the left kidney hilum lies on the transpyloric plane. B, the kidneys lie deep to the ninth and 10th ribs. C, the position of the kidneys are fixed during respiration. And D, the posterior aspects of the kidneys are next to T9 to T12. Yep, um, so I think I heard A, was it? Yep, so um, yep, the left kidney lies on the transpyloric plane. They lie deep to uh, the 11th and 12th rib, not the 9th and 10th, and they do move down during uh, inspiration and move up during expiration. Cool. Um, so onto renal fizz. So, so in terms of the functions of the kidney, the primary function of the kidney is to produce urine. And in doing so, it's able to A, balance the level of fluid in our body, um, to excrete waste products. So uh, it yeah, excretes things like urea. Um, and so you regulate the concentration of certain electrolytes, particularly your acids and bases. Its secondary function is to act um, in activating certain hormones and enzymes or releasing those hormones or enzymes. So it uh, releases EPO, erythropoietin, which stimulates red blood cell production. Um, it activates um, vitamin D to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, which is important in um, aiding calcium uh, absorption from the gut. And it also secretes renin, which is important in regulating of blood pressure. So when you're thinking about pathologies related to the kidney, just come back to these basic functions of the kidney. So if in something like chronic kidney disease, where the kidneys aren't working, um, because you're not able to uh, regulate your fluid, you're going to have a patient who's fluid overloaded, 
because they're not able to secrete acid and base properly, they're probably going to have metabolic acidosis and hyperkalemia. And because they're not removing their waste, waste products properly, um, they will have symptoms of uremia as well. And um, they'll also have symptoms of um, being unable to produce those hormones and enzymes. So we'll go into uh, that in a bit more depth uh, later on. So the basic renal process involves first uh, glomerular filtration, forming a filtrate which passes through the tubules and where it undergoes reabsorption into the peritubular capillaries and secretion from the peritubular capillaries into the tubules. So overall, the amount that's excreted is equal to the amount filtered plus the amount that's secreted minus the amount that's reabsorbed. So it's important to know the terminology here where secretion refers to substance moving from the capillaries into the tubules and reabsorption refers to something moving from the tubules back into the capillaries. Now, not all substances undergo all three of those processes. So, uh, for instance, your toxins, uh, your body wants to get rid of them. So it's not going to reabsorb any toxins. Um, things like glucose, which are important to... Um, your function, uh, your body wants to retain them, so it's going to reabsorb all your glucose. And that brings us on to the concept of clearance. So clearance refers to the volume of plasma from which a substance is completely removed by the kidneys per unit time. It's a bit of a confusing definition, um, and I think the equation makes a bit more sense. So uh, C equals U times V over P. Um, that basically refers to... Um, the amount of a substance in the urine divided by the concentration of that substance in a plasma. And if you think back to your like year 12 chemistry, that will give you a volume. And that re volume refers to the amount of plasma that's essentially being filtered by the kidneys. Something is not reabsorbed or secreted, it's only filtered, uh, freely filtered, then the clearance of that substance can give a good estimate of um, the glomerular filtration rate or um, the filtering function of the kidney. So uh, a couple substances which do that are creatinine and inulin. So inulin is freely filtered. It's not reabsorbed or secreted. So basically what you see in the urine is what you get. So that's the gold standard for measuring GFR um, because, yeah, it's not reabsorbed or secreted. However, it's a bit inconvenient to do in clinical practice um, since it's not a naturally occurring um, product and patients need to go undergo like a continuous infusion um, to have their inulin um, uh, measured. So instead, uh, in clinical practice, we use creatinine. So creatinine is a muscle breakdown product and it's freely filtered. It's secreted slightly, I think, in the proximal convoluted tubule. And um, it gives a, a pretty good estimate of the GFR. However, because the amount that you see in the urine is greater than the amount that's been filtered by the glomerulus, it actually overestimates the GFR slightly. Um, also, creatinine, because it's a muscle breakdown product, um, it varies between patients depending on how much muscle they have. So in a bodybuilder, you would expect to see a higher serum creatinine, whereas um, it's often lower in pregnant women and um, children as well as the elderly. So it's not, pre uh, it's not particularly sensitive between patients. However, it's pretty good in the same patient and monitoring them over time. All right, um, so onto glomerular filtration. So that's a process of urine formation where the plasma is filtered across the glomerular capillary membrane and forms a filtrate. So the GFR uh, is essentially how much plasma your kidney is filtering per unit time. And it's made up by the product of um, the capillary filtration coefficient and the net filtration pressure. So the capillary filtration coefficient um, is a product of the permeability by the filtering surface area. So it's essentially how, easy the, um, how easily the filtrate passes through the glomerular filtration barrier. Whereas the net filtration, uh, net filtration pressure is uh, the sum of all the forces acting across the glomerulus. Um, so it's the force that's driving filtration. So I'm going to talk a bit more about the net filtration pressure. So it's the sum of all the forces acting across this glomerular filtration barrier. So you can split it up into forces that favour filtration and forces that oppose filtration. 
So the forces that favor filtration are things like your glomerular hydrostatic pressure. So that's the force of fluid in the glomerulus pressing against that barrier and kind of forcing its way through. So that's going to favor filtration. Another force that favors filtration is Bowman's capsule osmotic pressure. So that's uh, the pressure exerted by like proteins in Bowman's capsule that draw fluid into there. However, Bowman's capsule uh, in a physiological state shouldn't have any proteins. So that's only seen in um, pathological states. Now the forces that oppose filtration are Bowman's capsule um, hydrostatic pressure. So that's the force of fluid in Bowman's capsule pressing against the uh, filtration barrier in the opposite direction and um, opposing filtration. You've also got uh, the glomerular on osmotic pressure. So that's the force of plasmas in your glomerulus which draw fluid into there. Um, so, yep. Okay. Um, so you can actually alter a lot of these um, forces. And the one that's most subject to change is the glomerular hydrostatic pressure. So because that's um, a force exerted by the fluid in the glomerulus, just by changing the amount of fluid in there, you can change the net filtration pressure and hence the GFR. And the way that you alter that is by changing the size of the vessels either side of the glomerulus. Now, um, Bowman's capsule uh, hydrostatic pressure can be altered if there's a buildup of fluid in Bowman's capsule, and that can occur if um, there's a backlog of fluid when the ureters are blocked and urine can't pass through. You can get um, a change in the glomerular osmotic pressure um, through a change in um, the concentration of plasma proteins, and that can occur with liver disease or protein urea. You can also get um, plasma uh, proteins that build up in Bowman's capsule in certain disease states, such as in nephrotic syndrome. Now, the um, capillary coefficient um, can also be altered. So, um, in states such as hypertension or diabetes, where there's destruction of the glomerulus um, and thickening of the basement membrane, that can mean that the uh, glomerular filtration barrier is less permeable to certain uh, substances. So it's important to know this because um, I think there's been like past questions on um, how certain things might change the net filtration pressure. Okay, cool. So the glomerular capillary membrane is made up of three layers. Um, you've got the endothelium. So that's much the same as um, any other capillary anywhere else in your body, except it has larger holes. So it's got more fenestrae and that allows more things to pass through. It's also got a negative charge, which um, helps to repel plasma proteins. Next, you've got the basement membrane, and that's got a strong negative charge that repels plasma proteins. And finally, the epithelial cells on the other side, um, they've got podocytes inserting into there and slit diaphragms in between. So um, that's going to limit what's able to pass through. So what the filtration barrier allows to pass through are small substances, so low molecular molecules, as well as electrolytes and water. What it doesn't allow to pass through are any large substance, so high molecular weight molecules, as well as proteins because of that negative charge and anything bound to proteins. Um, it also doesn't allow blood to pass through. So if you ever see protein or blood in the urine, that generally indicates a pathological process in play. So as we talked about before, the way that we alter the GFR is by changing the net filtration pressure. And um, to do that, we change the glomerular hydrostatic pressure. And to do that, we change the size of the vessels either side of the glomerulus. So you've got your afferent arterial leading in and your efferent arterial leading out. Now, if you constrict the afferent arterial, what that's going to do is limit the amount of renal blood flow. So that's going to decrease the amount of force that um, fluid exerts um, within the glomerulus. So it decreases the glomerular hydrostatic pressure and hence the GFR. If you dilate the afferent arterial, it increases the amount of blood that's passing into the glomerulus and hence increases the net filtration pressure and GFR. Now on the other side, you've got the efferent arterial. So if you constrict the efferent arterial, that means that the blood kind of backs up and collects in the glomerulus. The blood's um, finds it more difficult to pass through. So there's an increased glomerular hydrostatic pressure, and that's also going to increase the GFR. Now, if the efferent arterial is dilated, 
then um, blood's going to pass through the, uh, the glomerulus really easily. So the glomerular hydrostatic pressure is decreased. So the way that we control the patency of those ves vessels either side of the glomerulus is via um, sympathetic hormonal or autocoid control. <clears throat> so sympathetic stimulation, much like anywhere else in your body, is going to constrict the arterioles. Um, so in fact, mild to moderate sympathetic nerve stimulation doesn't really change the GFR too much, whereas strong sympathetic nerve stimulation is um, going to drastically reduce the GFR. So um, what actually stimulates this sympathetic nerve response is uh, generally the baroreceptors, which are found in the carotid sinus or the aortic arch, and they respond to situations of low blood pressure. So when you have low blood pressure, uh, you get decreased stretch of the baroreceptors, um, and that sends a signal up to the brain, leads to increased sympathetic stimulation, constricts all your vessels, and causes a low GFR. So that's why in um, cases of hypotension, uh, such as in shock, uh, you can get end organ failure, such as um, renal failure. So the most common cause of acute kidney injury is due to hypoperfusion of the kidneys. The next uh, way of um, altering the GFR is through hormonal control. So the ones that are bolded are the important ones. So you've got atrial natriuretic peptide, and that's released from the right atrium. And what that does is, so it's released in response to high blood pressure. And what that does is it dilates the afferent arterial. So when you dilate the afferent arterial, you increase the GFR. The next important one is angiotensin II, and that's part of that renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And as the name suggests, it tenses the vessels. So um, it constricts both of the vessels. However, it preferentially constricts the efferent arterial. And I'll explain why in a second. So you also get, um, so at the same time as you get stimulation of angiotensin II release, you also get sti uh, stimulation of prostaglandin release. And prostaglandin dilates the arterioles, particularly the afferent arterial. And that has an effect in dampening the effect of angiotensin II. Um, so we'll talk more about this, but when the macular denser cells um, are stimulated to release renin and angiotensin and so on, at the same time, it produces prostaglandin, and that kind of dampens the effect of angiotensin II. So these two hormones kind of work together. So and the overall effect is that the afferent arterial is not constricted so much, whereas the efferent arterial is constricted. And so you have increased renal blood flow, and then because the blood has difficulty leaving the kidneys, you have an increased glomerular hydrostatic pressure, increased net filtration pressure, and hence an increased GFR. So onto the autoregulation system. Um, so that includes the, involves the juxtaglomerular complex, which is made up of these macular denser cells and juxtaglomerular cells. So the macular denser cells sit here um, at the junction of the thick ascending limb and the distal convoluted tubule. And what they do is they sense the concentration of salt in the tubules at this point. And the reason why there's macular denser cells at this particular point is because it's in close proximity to both the afferent and the efferent arterial. So its position here allows it to sense salt concentration which gives the macular denser cells an idea of what the glomerular filtration rate is like. And so it can then send signals locally to the afferent and efferent arterioles and control the size of those vessels. And hence, it can alter the GFR to um, regulate it. Um, so the juxtaglomerular cells are the ones that sit in those afferent and efferent arterial, and they respond to signals from the macular denser cells and they release renin, which kicks off that renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So you don't have any questions so far? Like, feel free to interrupt me. Okay. Um, so the tubular glomerular feedback uh, involves those cells that we talked about before. So the macular denser cell, it senses um, changes in the sodium concentration. So in the case of a low sodium concentration, it knows that um, the glomerulus isn't filtering enough plasma. So as a result, it wants to increase the GFR um, to bring it back to equilibrium. So what it does is the macular denser cell secretes prostaglandin itself. And remember that 
dilates um, the vessels, particularly the afferent arteria. And then it sends a signal to the juxtaglomerular cells and they secrete renin and renin um, initiates that RAS cycle. So you get production of angiotensin II. That's going to constrict um, both your vessels, but because the afferent arterial has kind of been dilated already, it's not constricted so much, whereas the efferent <coughs> arterial is constricted. So as a result, you have increased renal pl uh, plasma flow and the blood kind of stays in the kidney, in the glomerulus. Um, you get increased glomerular hydrostatic pressure and increased GFR. So that kind of brings the GFR back up to normal. Now, in the case of um, a high salt concentration, um, the macular denser cell knows that um, that indicates a high GFR, so it wants to bring the GFR back down to normal. So it secretes adenosine, and what that does is it constricts the afferent uh, arterial and inhibits renin release, so that just decreases the renal plasma flow. You don't need to know too much about um, the case of increased salt in the tubules, whereas um, this particular uh, feedback system is quite important. So uh, that, yeah. Um, is the prostaglandin actually what stimulates the uh, juxtaposition cells to the or is it? No, it's something else. Um, I'm not too sure what it is actually, but I just know that there's a um, some form of signal that goes to juxtaglomerular cells. So the macular denser cells secrete prostaglandin themselves, and the juxtaglomerular cells are the ones that secrete renin. Cool. So on to tubular processing. So this is where all that secretion and reabsorption occurs. So we're going to talk about um, reabsorption first. So the mechanisms in which that occurs is by um, passive diffusion, and that goes down a concentration gradient. So um, water does that. Um, it can also substances can also move into, back into the blood via active transport. So that can be either primary or secondary. Um, primary involves some form of like ATP or some form of energy. So those that's typically your sodium potassium pump. Secondary involves um, two or more substances which interact with each other and they um, carry a protein on the surface of the cell and they kind of go down together. Um, an important concept to know about is the transport maximum. So that's uh, where all the carrier proteins in the tubules are saturated. So at that point, you can't have any more solute transport. So that's important in the case of diabetes. So people with diabetes, they have a lot of glucose in their blood, and that glucose is freely filtered across the glomerular filtration barrier, ends up in the tubules. And there's so much glucose in the tubules that it saturates all those carrier proteins. So usually glu um, glucose is 100% reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule, but now you find that you have glucose that ends up in the urine. And that glucose also exerts an osmotic force, so it draws water back into the tubules. So people with diabetes will present with um, polyuria or frequency because they have an increased urine output, um, and you'll also find some glucose in their urine as well. Okay, so we're just going to run through um, all the different parts of the tubule um, and the anatomy, what goes on in that part, and some of the pumps. So in the proximal convoluted tubule, that's where most of your electrolytes get reabsorbed. Um, so sodium, fluoride, potassium, uh, bicarb, as well as 100% um, of your glucose, lactose, and amino acids. Um, so because you have reabsorption of so many electrolytes, and remember, sodium reabsorption requires a primary active transporter, so that requires ATP, you have a lot of mitochondria within those cells to supply that energy. And because there's so much being reabsorbed, you have an extensive brush border. So a brush border is essentially um, all these microvilli that are densely packed, um, and they like increase the surface area and they aid reabsorption. Okay, um, now onto the loop of Henle. So the thin descending limb, only water is reabsorbed here. So because there's no primary active process in play, there's no uh, not many mitochondria at least, and because not much is being reabsorbed, there's no brush borders. Um, and so water reabsorption has to pass through aquaporin channels. Um, now onto the thin ascending loom. Uh, so it's much the same as the thin descending limb, except nothing's reabsorbed here, so it's kind of useless. Um, now the thick ascending limb, that's where the rest of your electrolytes are reabsorbed. So as a result, you have 
um, quite a few mitochondria again. You also have um, thicker cells because of that, but you don't have a brush border because um, there's really not that much stuff being reabsorbed. Um, and importantly, you have the NK2CC um, symporter pump there, and that's the site of action of one of your diuretics, the loop diuretics. And also you can get some potassium secretion in this part of the um, loop of Henle. Now at the distal convoluted tubule, um, so the early distal convoluted tubule is much the same as the thick ascending limb. The late distal convoluted tubule has um, a few special cells. So it's got the primary cells and they reabsorb sodium, secrete potassium, um, and they are um, stimulated by one of your hormones, aldosterone. You've also got the intercalated cells and they're responsible for acid-base secretion. So alpha, remember A for acid, alpha secretes acid, beta secretes base. <laughs> Um, and finally, with the collecting ducts, um, the medullary collecting duct is an important one, and that's the final site of urine processing. And that's where um, any changes to the amount of urine occurs, and that's dependent on one of the hormones, antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. So just got a nice little table to summarise all of that. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about sodium and water processing, which is the most important part of tubular processing. So the way that sodium is reabsorbed is that it uh, passes by diffusion down into the tubular epithelial cells, and then it's pumped against its concentration gradient into the interstitial fluid by these sodium-potassium pumps. So kind of buzzwordy, um, the sodium-potassium pumps are on the basolateral surface, whereas things just diffuse across the apicoluminal surface. And so what that pump does is it maintains a low um, concentration of salt within the cell and that allows um, sodium to move down the concentration gradient. And so water is coupled to sodium reabsorption. So whenever you have sodium reabsorption, it osmotically draws the water along with it. Um, so typically water is reabsorbed in the same parts as sodium. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about urine concentration. So um, that last thing I said, where sodium, uh, where water is reabsorbed um, in the same areas that sodium is, it's not entirely true. So if you look at the table, you can see that um, sodium is not reabsorbed in the de descending limb of the loop of Henle, where, whereas it is reabsorbed in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, and um, water is kind of the opposite. So the way that the body kind of... Um, allows that to happen is with this countercurrent system. So, um, yeah, so sodium is reabsorbed in this part of the loop of Henle, but not in the descending limb, and water is reabsorbed here, but not in the ascending limb. So the problem is how can water be reabsorbed in the descending limb of the loop of Henle if there's no sodium reabsorption to osmotically drag it out? So the way that the body solves this problem is by having this um, countercurrent system so that the descending and the ascending limb share this interstitium in between. And that interstitium is a hyperosmotic interstitium. So what happens is sodium is reabsorbed in the ascending limb and it concentrates in this um, interstitium here in between the two limbs of the loop of Henle. And so that sodium there has an effect on the descending limb and manages to draw water out of the descending limb. So more sodium is reabsorbed than water is um, in the loops of Henle. So by the time that it gets to the distal convoluted tubule, you have a hypoosmotic um, fluid within the tubules. And then in the um, cortical collecting ducts, they're kind of reabsorbed um, in the same ratio and it kind of returns to normal. And then in the medullary collecting duct, the reabsorption of water can vary quite drastically between five to 25%. And that depends on um, whether there's antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. So what ADH does is it um, acts at this medullary collecting duct and it stimulates the insertion of aquaporin channels so water needs aquaporin channels to pass back into the cell. Um, so ADH is secreted in response to um, 
changes in osmolarity. And that's sensed by these osmoreceptors in the paraventricular and supraoptic nuclei of the posterior um, of the posterior pituitary in the hypothalamus. So when there's a um, decreased osmolarity, that essentially means that um, wait, sorry, yeah. So when there's an increased osmolarity, um, that essentially means there's too much salt in the system, not enough water. So the osmoreceptors will shrink and they'll send a signal down to the posterior pituitary where there's release of antidiuretic hormone. And that antidiuretic hormone acts at the medullary collecting duct, um, stimulates insertion of aquaporin channels. So it means that more water is reabsorbed and you retain the water that you already have. At the same time, it also stimulates thirst. Um, so when you like eat a lot of salt, you feel thirsty straight after. That's because of these osmoreceptors um, uh, forcing you to drink more water. And also you'll notice that you won't be urinating as much because of the um, effect of antidiuretic hormone. As his name suggests, it prevents diuresis. Okay, um, yeah, so putting it all together, in the case of low blood pressure, for instance, in dehydration or shock, there's two kind of mechanisms in play. So you've got your osmoreceptors, which sense an increased osmolarity and releases ADH, and um, hence retains all the water that you have already. And so that tries to maintain the blood pressure. When you have low blood pressure, it also stimulates the baroreceptors and that initiates that sympathetic nerve stimulation, um, which results in constriction of your arterioles and um, causes a decreased GFR and, also, and hence um, reduces the urine output as well. You've also got your intrarenal baroreceptors, another name for the juxtaglomerular cells, which secrete renin. Um, and as a result, you get um, formation of angiotensin II, which um, furthers that cycle and um, retains salt and water and maintains the blood pressure. Okay, so we've got a few questions. Um, destruction of the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei of the hypothalamus will produce which of the following changes in urinary volume and concentration? Um, Um, so, does anyone have an answer? A, yeah, I'm hearing A. Okay, good. So, um, because of destruction of those nuclei in the hypothalamus, you won't have antidiuretic hormone production, and so hence you get an increased urine volume um, and very dilute urine. Okay, next one. Um, when the glomerular filtrate reaches the distal tubule, um, a, more sodium than water has been reabsorbed. B, the fluid is hypoosmotic. C, more water than sodium has been reabsorbed. D, the macular denser cell stimulate the release of aldosterone to regulate sodium excretion in the collecting duct. And E, A, and B. Um, anyone got an answer? Yeah, good. Um, so it's E, A and B. Um, they essentially say the same thing. Um, but if you remember, more salt is reabsorbed um, in the loop of Henle than water is. So it's gonna, the fluid in the tubule is going to end up hypoosmotic by the time it reaches the DCT. So which one of the following statements is correct? A, in the human kidney, most nephrons are juxtamedullary. B, the glomeruli of the juxtamedullary nephrons are in the renal medulla. C, cortical nephrons have long loops of Henle. D, vasa recta are associated with cortical nephrons. And E, all glomeruli are found in the renal cortex. E, good. Oh, did we? Okay, <laughs> my bad. Um, so if the clearance of the substance um, X, Y, and inulin um, are such that clearance of X is greater than clearance of inulin, which is greater than clearance of substance Y. It's a bit confusing. Uh, 
So then, yeah, I'll just let you guys read this one. Um, anyone have an answer? A? Okay, good. Yeah, so it's A. So remember that inulin is neither secreted nor reabsorbed. So anything that has um, a higher clearance than inulin, um, such as creatinine, for instance, will have been secreted, uh, whereas anything that has a lower clearance than inulin um, would have been reabsorbed. Okay. So the primary active step for sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule involves... See? Yep. Good. Um, so remember the difference between the basolateral and the apicoluminal membrane? Um, because, yeah, that's pretty important. Okay. So in pressure naturesis, um, A... Yeah, I'm not going to read this one out. Any takers? Yeah, you. <laughs> A? Yeah, good. A. Um, so, uh, pressure naturesis is um, sometimes you hear it being referred to as pressure naturesis and diuresis. Um, they kind of occur at the same time. So, in the case of like high blood pressure, where you have an increased glomerular hydrostatic pressure, that's going to cause increased filtration of sodium um, into the tubules. And as a result, that sodium is going to be able to exert an osmotic force. So you have less reabsorption of water. So you'll be excreting more sodium and also more water. So that's why you have naturesis and diuresis at the same time. Um, so which... Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Decreased Yeah. Um, yeah, so pressure naturesis is about like a high blood pressure, yeah. Okay, um, so which of the following would not be increased after an acute hemorrhage? A, ADH, B, aldosterone, C, renin, D, A and P, and E, angiotensin 2. Any answers? D? Yeah, good. So um, A and P is released in a situation of high blood pressure um, rather than high blood, hypotension. So with regards to ADH secretion, which combination results in the highest secretion of ADH? Um, ignore that part there. <laughs> Any answers? B? Yep, good. So um, ADH is uh, stimulated. So the osmoreceptors respond to both 
um, osmolality as well as volume. However, they're a lot more sensitive, sensitive to changes in osmolarity. So um, it requires quite a large drop in blood pressure to stimulate the osmoreceptors. But it does respond to both of them. Okay, cool. So on to the next bit, which is tubular secretion. So this is all our acid-based stuff. Um, okay, so um, it's important to know some of the normal ranges. Um, so the normal pH in the extracellular fluid is between 7.35 to 7.45. Um, so anything lower than that is deemed acidotic. Anything higher than that is alkalotic. So remember that when you're looking at arterial blood gases, because it can be confusing at times with the CO2 and the bicarb. But if you um, just stick to the pH, you'll, you won't get that bit wrong. Um, so where does all this acid come from? Um, you have volatile acid production, which is through production of carbon dioxide, and also non-volatile, which is through production of uh, sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid, lactic acid, keto acids, and so on. Now, normally, um, in a physiological state, um, acid is buffered, and in the extracellular fluid, it's usually buffered by bicarb, can also be buffered by phosphate, and within the cell, it's usually buffered by hemoglobin. <clears throat> now, um, your lungs are responsible for excretion of volatile acid, and so they control the CO2 part of the equation um, by um, expiring CO2. So when someone hyper hyperventilates, um, they expire a lot of CO2, and that causes a drop in the amount of acid. Now, if they hypoventilate, so they breathe off less CO2, they, um, it causes retention of CO2 and increased um, acid in the system. And because your respirate can alter really quickly, um, respiratory acid base control typically occurs within minutes, whereas uh, renal acid base control takes hours to days. So, um, yeah, so the kidneys usually take longer to compensate for a respiratory acid base disorder, whereas um, the lungs will respond pretty quickly to a uh, metabolic acid base disorder. <clears throat> so they're responsible for excretion of non-volatile acids, and what they do is they control the bicarb part of the equation. So this occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. Um, so acid isn't really secreted. It's um, So what happens is you have carbon dioxide and water that come into the cell, um, and they become um, acid and base by the action of carbonic and hydrase. And then the acid kind of moves out of the cell via this NAH um, antiporter, where, whereas the um, bicarb is reabsorbed into the blood. And then the H plus is combined with another bicarb, and that cycle repeats. So you see that the acid isn't really secreted, nor is it reabsorbed. It kind of just um, continues this loop, and it aids in transporting the base back into the cell, where it can be um, easily reabsorbed. Now, if you have, um, uh, so you can also have excretion of fixed acid, and this typically occurs when uh, reabsorption of bicarb is not enough to maintain your acid-base control. So your kidneys will actively secrete acid in the form of um, NH4 NH4 plus or H2PO4 minus. Um, and you don't need to know like the exact mechanism in which it does it does that, um, but you just need to know in what form it secretes those um, new acids. And when it secretes that new acid, sorry, not new acid, when it secretes that acid, you have reabsorption of new bicarbonate. Um, and when I mean new, it's um, bicarb that has been generated out of this equation. It's not bicarb that was originally in the tubules and has been kind of transported across. So onto your ABGs. Um, so the first step, um, so when you interpret an ABG and you have a few in your exam, it's important to follow a systematic order. So first thing you want to do is check the pH. Is it acidotic or is it alkalotic? After that, you want to check the CO2 and the HCO3 minus. And you look and see if there's a rise or fall in either of them, 
which can explain that acidosis or alkalosis. After that, you look at the opposing value. So if it's a uh, metabolic disorder, you look at the CO2 to see if there's any respiratory compensation. And similarly, if it's a respiratory disorder, you look at the um, bicarb to see if there's any renal compensation for that. And yeah, make sure you remember the normal ranges. They should provide it in the exam. Um, so um, yeah, onto compensation. Uh, so the only two Boston rules that you really need to know are the ones for your respiratory acidosis and your metabolic acidosis. So uh, respiratory acidosis, because it requires renal compensation, uh, it takes quite a while to do so. So you have an acute compensation as well as a chronic compensation. So the acute is the increase of one um, bicarb for every increase of 10 carbon dioxide, whereas the, uh, whereas the chronic is an increase of four bicarb for every 10 carbon dioxide. Whereas for metabolic acidosis, uh, because it's the lungs that are compensating, um, they can just breathe off the CO2 pretty easily. So it, there's no acute or chronic. Um, you've just got the one equation to remember. So the CO2 will be equal to 1.5 times bicarb plus eight. Okay, so the various acid-based disorders you have are metabolic acidosis, alkalosis, respiratory acidosis, and alkalosis. So uh, we might talk a bit more about metabolic acidosis later, but metabolic alkalosis occurs when you have a loss of um, too much bicarb. And that can occur with, um, sorry, um, when you have too much bicarb in your system. So that can occur with excess acid loss by diarrhea or vomiting. It can also occur with renal acid loss by diuretics um, or overdose of base um, or some endocrine disorders. Now, respiratory acidosis occurs when you have an increase in CO2. So um, that occurs with um, a problem with ventilation, decreased ventilation. And that can occur with a decreased respiratory drive, so some form of damage to the brain, uh, decreased chest wall movement, that, which can occur with uh, neuromuscular disorders, as well as um, obstructive pulmonary disease, such as COPD and asthma. Now, re uh, respiratory alkalosis occurs when you have um, too little CO2. That can result uh, from hyperventilation or high altitude. So metabolic acidosis brings us onto the concept of the anion gap. Yep. You can actually get um, acidosis and alkalosis. It depends on like, I guess, what type of diarrhea you're having. Yeah, um, but it's just one of the causes. Um, but I do agree with you. Um, you're more likely to lose acid via vomiting than via diarrhea. Um, so the anion gap is a concept that's uh, brought up with metabolic acidosis. So you can classify metabolic acidosis as either having a high anion gap, normal anion gap, or low anion gap. So what the anion gap is, um, it's used um, to measure the unmeasured anions. Um, so when you order a UEC, um, urea electrolyte creatinine, um, you get this electrolyte panel, which includes sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarb. So it only includes four of your electrolytes out of the probably like hundreds that you have. Um, so there's a lot of unmeasured anions in that, um, in that electrolyte panel. Normally, the serum um, in your body is neutral. So technically, you should have um, balanced cations and balanced anions. However, um, yeah, so the anion gap just refers to those unmeasured anions in your serum. So you know that you're going to have um, an anion, you should have an anion gap of zero, but it's a relatively artificial concept because you can't actually measure all the cations and anions in your serum. So the anion gap just gives you um, how many unmeasured anions there are. And those unmeasured anions include uh, phosphate, sulfate, organic acids, lactic acid, keto acids, and so on. So if you have a high anion gap, it indicates that there's an um, excess of those unmeasured anions, 
So it can give you an idea as to what's the cause behind your metabolic acidosis. So if you have a high anion gap, you would expect to have um, things like high lactic acid, high keto acid in DKA, um, high amounts of like salicylic acid in um, uh, like aspirin um, paracetamol toxicity. So the way that you can remember it is with this uh, mnemonic LTKR, so excess lactic, lactate, toxins, ketones, or various renal causes. Now, if you have a normal anion gap, it just means that you have like excess of acid, but it's not those unmeasured anions. So that can occur with chloride excess, um, various drugs such as acetazolamide, um, Addison's disease, as well as GI cause. So that's where the diarrhea comes into play. Um, and so when you're calculating the anion gap, because um, I think we got a question about that last year, um, make sure that you don't include the potassium because um, the potassium only contributes a small amount to all the electrolytes. So um, generally people don't include it in their calculation of anion gap. Um, so you might see like some anion gaps, um, some websites stating that the normal anion gap is 20 but that's if you take into account potassium. So if you don't take into account potassium, the normal anion gap, it should be six to 12. Okay. Oh my God, <laughs> fuck, sorry. Um, yeah, so bicarbonate is mostly absorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. Cool. Um, yeah, so a patient presents with metabolic acidosis, which of the following would be observed? B, yep, good. Um, so in metabolic acidosis, you'll see uh, respiratory compensation. So um, the person will be trying to breathe off all their carbon dioxide, so they'll be hyperventilating, and they'll, there's a specific form of respiration that you'll see known as Kuzmal's respiration. Um, so yeah, interpret the ABG. So you've got a pH of 7.29. Um, what does that indicate? Acidosis, yep. Um, so is it a metabolic or respiratory? Yep, good, because you've got a high CO2. And is it compensated or not? Yep, okay. So it actually doesn't have compensation because um, the normal range of bicarb should, is around 24, right, 22 to 26. So typically what you'll see in uh, respiratory acidosis is you'll see um, an increase in bicarb to make up for that. So that's the compensation mechanism. So here, the bicarb isn't um, raised more outside the normal range, so it still hasn't been compensated yet. Does that kind of make sense? Um, so there is an actual equation for this. Um, uh, if we go back earlier, um, so a rise of um, so a rise of one bicarb for every increase of ten CO two, or an increase of four bicarb for every increase of ten CO two. Okay, I see what, yeah. Okay, yeah, no, no. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I see where you're coming from. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I got these ABGs from a website, so... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think in the exam you would get a more, a definitely a more black and white one because you could argue that with this one you don't exactly have an increase of 10 CO2 and hence you might see a bit more um, of a renal compensation. Um, but yeah, in an exam you might get like 50 and then you'll get like 25 as well. 
Cool. Okay. So is this one um, acidotic or alkalotic? Alkalotic, good. And is it uh, respiratory or metabolic? Yeah, so it's metabolic. And is it compensated or not? So it is compensated um, because you see the CO2 uh, rising out of its norm um, to compensate for that drop in, uh, for that increase in the bicarbonate. So is this one acidotic or alkalotic? Acidotic? And is it um, metabolic or respiratory? Metabolic? Yep. And would you say it's compensated? The PAC2 is low in this one. Yeah. Um, so in metabolic acidosis, um, so remember when, um, okay, yeah, if we go back to this one, um, sorry, I forgot to mention this earlier. So if something is compensated, you actually see the pH go back into its normal range because it means that your body is like um, balanced out whatever um, problems it's having with acid base. So that's the reason why you don't get compensation in this one because the pH hasn't gone back to its normal range. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah? All right. Um, yeah, sorry, these ABGs aren't particularly good. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll like I'll revise them and then I'll send I'll upload a better better quality uh, better quality version of them. Okay, so we're just going to finish up with the physiology bit. Um, so onto micturition. So that's the final step, peeing out your urine. Um, so it's important to know the innovation of the bladder. So you've got three different types of muscle in your bladder. You've got the detrusor smooth muscle, which is responsible for contraction of the bladder and squeezing out of urine. You've got the internal urethral sphincter, which is responsible for preventing uh, retrograde ejaculation. And you've got the external urethral sphincter, which is uh, important in preventing, uh, retaining your continence. During filling of the bladder, the detrusor muscle is relaxed and the two sphincters are constricted. During voiding, you have contraction of the detrusor muscle and relaxation of your two sphincters. So the reflex that occurs is um, you have afferent fibers running from your bladder to the spinal cord, and then um, you have PNS um, efferent fibers running towards the um, detrusor muscle, and that's via the pelvic nerve, and that's going to stimulate contraction of the bladder. At the same time, you have a signal that goes up to your brain, and uh, that's the point where you can control um, whether you want to relax your external sphincter or not, um, depending on if you're in public or near bathroom. Um, all right. Um, so incontinence is when that system breaks down. So stress incontinence, um, so the first one is kind of like a mechanical failure or um, a muscular failure. So that's when there's weakness of the sphincters itself, and that can occur with... Um, trauma to that area, such as in childbirth, um, weakness of the puborectalis muscle. Urge incontinence is when you have an overactive bladder, so you've got like too many fibres going through that reflex arc, so you have um, detrusor muscle contraction with like small amounts of stress. Spastic or reflex bladder occurs when you have a spinal cord injury above the level of T12, so you still have that reflex arc, so you still have 
afferent to the spinal cord and efferent to the detrusor muscle, but you don't have a signal going up to your brain telling you, allowing you to um, relax your sphincters. So hence you have contraction of a bladder against a closed sphincter. So you're not going to get any urine coming out. Instead, you're going to have um, urine probably going up the ureters into the kidneys, and that's known as hydronephrosis. Flaccid bladder occurs when um, there's a spinal cord injury below the level of T12, so that destroys that reflex arc. So you no longer have afferent fibres and efferent fibres running around there. So um, that just means that the bladder is not going to contract at all. It's just going to keep expanding and expanding with increased urine in there. And eventually you can get uh, urine flowing back up to the kidneys, um, or you can get even rupture. Okay, so during bladder filling, um, a parasympathetic stimulation causes the detrusor muscle to relax, while sympathetic will cause the internal sphincter to constrict. B, parasympathetic causes the detrusor muscle to contract, while sympathetic will cause the internal sphincter to constrict. Um, C, sympathetic innervation causes the external muscle to contract, while the parasympathetic stimulation will cause the internal sphincter to relax. And D, sympathetic stimulation causes the detrusor muscle to relax, while parasympathetic stimulation will relax the internal sphincter. Any answers? Any answer? A? Yep, good. So, um, yeah, so your parasympathetic is uh, responsible for your micturition reflex. So just remember that when you have, um, yeah, so, sorry, uh, when you have parasympathetic stimulation, it relaxes the detrusor muscle while the um, sympathetic innervation goes towards your internal sphincter and your so uh, external, external sphincter is controlled by somatic nerves because it's a skeletal muscle. So on to pharmacology. Um, we've just got three different types of diuretics. So first of all, loop diuretics, also known as frusamide or Lasix. So the way you remember it is fruity loops. And they act at the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle on those NK2CC symporters. And so what that does is it prevents reabsorption of sodium and hence you don't get water reabsorption that goes along with it. So this has the greatest diuretic eff efficacy because of the fact that it acts most proximally. So remember, you have the most sodium reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule, slightly less in the thick ascending limb and even less further on after that. So what we use this for is um, when a patient is quite fluid overloaded. So in uh, congestive heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, liver cirrhosis, um, or renal failure. Um, the side effects are because you're not getting reabsorption of K+, you have hypokalemia. Now, the thiazide diuretics, they act a bit distally at the distal convoluted tubule. Um, so an example of a thiazide di diuretic is hydrochlorothiazide, uh, pretty easy to remember. And that blocks a NaCl symporter, so that prevents um, sodium reabsorption. And because that has less diuretic efficacy, it's used for more mild to moderate cases of heart failure or hypertension. Then you've got the potassium sparing diuretics um, and you've got two types, aldosterone antagonists. So that's spironolactone and epilerenone um, and they inhibit the effect of aldosterone. So you have less sodium and potassium channel insertion into the luminal membrane um, in the like distal convoluted tubule or cortical collecting duct. Um, and this is a really good drug in heart failure. It has a mortality benefit and it's often combined with loop and thiazide diuretics to achieve um, diuretic efficacy without hypokalemia. The problem with that is you might get hyperkalemia um, as a consequence. Um, you've also got your sodium channel blockers, which is amylaride. Cool. 
Um, so important thing to know about is the triple whammy. So that's the combination of ACE inhibitor, NSAIDs, and diuretics. Um, and it's really harmful for, to the kidneys because with ACE, um, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, you don't get production of angiotensin 2. So as a result, you don't get constriction of that efferent arterial. So the efferent arterial is dilated. Uh, with NSAID, that inhibits prostaglandin. And remember, prostaglandin dilates the afferent arterial. So instead, you have like a constricted afferent arterial. So you already have decreased renal plasma flow. And because the efferent arterial is dilated, you have um, decreased glomerular hydrostatic pressure. And then when you give them a diuretic as well, that um, decreases the total amount of fluid. And so um, that reduces the GFR even further. Um, and that's particularly harmful to the kidneys, particularly in the setting of acute kidney injury. However, in real life, a lot of these patients are on um, at least two of those drugs. So ACE inhibitor and diuretics are um, very common combinations for people uh, with chronic kidney disease or heart failure. And it's actually usually the NSAID which causes um, the most damage when it's added on top. Okay, so moving on to pathology. Um, so we're on the home stretch now. So acute kidney injury, the definition for that is a increase of creatinine by more than 50% or a low urine output of less than 0 0.5 mils per kilo per hour for six hours. So that's for the average person um, around like 200 mils for six hours. And um, the important thing to know about acute kidney injury is the classification system. So you can classify it as either pre-renal, renal or post-renal. So pre-renal is any problem with hypoperfusion to the kidney, not enough blood getting into the kidney. So that can occur with shock, um, and shock can occur with hypovolemic shock, uh, septic shock, cardiogenic, anaphylactic shock, and so on. It can also occur with bilateral renal artery stenosis. So that's a bit of a rare one because um, your kidneys have so much reserve function that you really need a blockage of both of the renal arteries leading into the kidneys to cause acute kidney injury. And finally, the triple whammy, um, as we talked about before, that um, hypoperfuses the kidney and that predisposes to damage. Now, post-renal is all about obstruction. So that's when um, the fluid can't get out. So um, it kind of collects in the kidney, um, increases the Bowman's capsule uh, glomerular, oh, sorry, Bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure, and hence decreases the GFR. Um, so that can occur with calculi, uh, be a benign prostatic hyperplasia or things like pelvic tumors. However, it's also a bit of a rare cause because again, your kidneys have so much reserve function that you really need a blockage of both of your kidneys or um, in the setting of a patient with only one working kidney to cause acute kidney injury from a post-renal cause. Um, so the most common cause is pre-renal renal failure. Um, Renal acute kidney injury is essentially just damage to the kidneys itself. Um, so that can commonly occur with um, iatrogenic con uh, causes such as contrast-induced nephropathy, um, drugs, uh, particularly nephrotoxic drugs such as gentamicin, as well as all the other various um, uh, renal diseases such as glomerulonephritis. So in terms of management of acute kidney injury, uh, it's pretty easy to manage. You just treat the cause. So if the kidney is hypoperfused, you reperfuse the kidney. So if someone's dehydrated, you give them fluids. If they have uh, the triple whammy, you take them off those drugs. Um, if um, you've got some obstruction causing kidney injury, you relieve the obstruction and the patient gets better. So chronic kidney disease is um, defined as a GFR of less than 90 um, or evidence of renal impairment. So that can manifest as proteinuria or hematuria. And because it's chronic, it has to be for a period of three months or more. <clears throat> so um, you don't really need to know about the staging except for that end stage kidney disease occurs when the GFI is less than 15. So people like to think of the GFI as kind of a percentage out of 100. So if you've got um, stage one um, CKD, you've got like 60 to 90% of your kidney function you've got stage five, you've got less than 15% of your kidney function. Um, so how people with CKD will, will present 
um, if we go back to the primary functions of the kidney, um, so primary function of the kidney is production of urine, right? So if you aren't producing urine as well, then the patient will be fluid overloaded. So they'll have, you know, raised JVP, they'll have fluid overload in their lungs, causing um, dyspnea, orthopnea, PND, you'll have bilateral inspiratory crackles, um, and they might have fluid overload in their peripheries, causing peripheral edema. They also, um, yeah, also as a result, they, um, they're not peeing out as much, so you have oliguria and anuria. However, a lot of the cases of CKD are actually asymptomatic, and it's kind of found on a routine blood test. <clears throat> so uh, because the kidney is not excreting waste, for instance, urea, you get urea buildup in the blood, which causes uremia uh, signs and symptoms. So the classic one is a uremic flap, and that indicates um, um, some form of, uh, it indicates uh, pretty severe chronic kidney disease. Um, you can also get pericarditis with uremia, as well as um, pruritus and a characteristic breath, cell, breath smell known as uremic fetal. Now, the complications of CKD, um, again, you think about the primary functions of the kidney. So hypertension, because they're not managing the balancing their fluids as well. Electrolyte abnormalities, such as metabolic acidosis and hyperkalemia, because they're not balancing their electrolytes as well. Um, CKD MBD stands for chronic kidney, chronic kidney disease mineral bone disorder. And that is um, a complication of, uh, it's got two components to its pathogenesis. Primarily, it's due to um, inability of the kidneys to excrete phosphate properly. So you get buildup of phosphate, hyperphosphatemia, and that phosphate binds to calcium. And so you get hypocalcemia as a result. Um, and that causes a secondary hyperparathyroidism. Um, so because you have low calcium in your blood, um, your body wants to get calcium from somewhere, so it takes it from your bones, so it causes bone resorption. So it's kind of like osteoporosis, but it's a different um, clinical syndrome. The other uh, pathogenesis, be pathogenesis behind it is uh, low vitamin D because your kidneys activate vitamin D, so um, you get less absorption of calcium from the gut. The kidneys also produce EPO, and when you don't have that, you become anemic. Um, and people with chronic kidney disease actually have pretty high um, cardiovascular disease mortality. And that's because of high blood pressure, but also because of phosphate binding to calcium and forming these um, kind of crystals which deposit in your vessels um, and can cause all sorts of problems. Right. So uh, next we've got glomerulonephritis, um, which is a... Pretty confusing topic, but in your exams, uh, it's relatively buzzwordy. Um, so glomerulonephritis isn't a disease, it's a group of diseases um, characterized by damage and inflammation of your glomerulus. And you can classify it as either being nephrotic syndrome or nephritic syndrome. And nephrotic and nephritic syndrome, again, aren't diseases. Syndromes are ways that people will present. So nephrotic syndrome is characterized primarily by proteinuria, and the protein urea is greater than 3.5 grams per day. So that differentiates it from protein urea secondary to diabetes, for instance. It's actually really, really heavy protein urea. Um, and that protein urea occurs due to podocyte um, damage. So you get protein leaking through the glomerular filtration barrier. And the rest of the uh, clinical features you can kind of derive from that. So if you have protein urea, you have less albumin within your bloodstream. And then as a result, uh, you have hypoalbuminemia, less osmotic force generated by, those, by that albumin, and hence the fluid extravasates out of the vessels into um, um, like other body compartments. So that can manifest as edema. And you also get hyperlipidemia as well. Oh, yeah, so the LEAP thing, um, the L stands for lipidemia, not hyperlipidemia. Um, so examples of nephrotic syndrome are minimal change, focal segmental, as well as membranous nephropathy. Now, nephritic syndrome, oh, sorry, the way that I remember that is nephrotic has an O in it, and so does proteinuria. It's not, it's not that great, um, uh, but it works for me. So nephritic syndrome is characterized by hematuria. You can also see proteinuria because 
Um, nephritic syndrome is where there's damage to the um, glomerulus causing leakage of red blood cells. So if you have leakage of red blood cells, you probably also have leakage of protein as well. But the difference is the leakage of protein is nowhere near um, as much as the leakage in nephrotic syndrome. <clears throat> so nephritic syndrome is generally all those um, antibody related diseases. So it's caused by antibodies um, depositing in the glomerulus and causing inflammation and damage and scarring, um, allowing blood to pass through. Um, so what you'll see is hematuria and red blood cell casts. Um, you might see a bit of proteinuria as well. So the diseases included there are your all your antibody ones, so IgA, post-GEP, anti-GBN, and palsy immune. So the nephrotic syndromes, um, you just need to remember like a few kind of buzzwords for each of the conditions, and that should get you through your exams. So minimal change is the one that affects children. And as the name suggests, you'll see minimal change. So there's generally the kidney functions are actually normal. Um, so for some reason, they'll have heavy proteinuria, but their kidneys are relatively normal. And it responds to prednisolone. Focal segmental um, is... Um, kind of like minimal, minimal change. Um, as the name suggests, you get focal areas of glomerular sclerosis. So if you do a renal biopsy of someone with uh, FSGS, they might have some bits which are normal and some bits which are abnormal. Now, the uh, thing to remember about this is that it does not respond to prednisolone. Membranous GN is the most common GN um, and affects adults primarily. Um, it's associated with things like hepatitis B, um, drugs like NSAIDs and gold, um, and it has this rule of three, so one-third progress, one-third remit, and one-third reach and stage kidney disease. Now, your nephritic syndromes, as I said before, they're all your antibody ones. So IgA nephropathy is when you have IgA deposition within the glomerulus, causing damage to the glomerulus. And if you remember, IgA is uh, secreted or is made um, by like mucus lining um, tracts of your body. So after a upper respiratory tract infection, one to two days after, you will get IgA production, which can deposit in your kidneys and cause nephropathy. Post-infectious is um, after a strep infection, typically strep throat caused by strep pyogenes, and that occurs two to three weeks after. So strep throat is also an, an upper respiratory tract infection, so it's kind of similar, but the thing is, post strep GN is caused by IgG antibody deposition. And IgG is produced later on in the infection compared to IgA. So that's the main difference there. Anti-GBM um, is anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies that deposit in your kidneys and cause damage. You can also have um, anti-GBM um, antibodies that deposit in your lungs and cause damage of the alveolar basement membrane and that's known as good pastures disease. Palsy immune glomerulonephritis, uh, they're all your vasculitis associated ones. So vasculitis is associated with ANCA. So it's a blood test you can do to check if someone has vasculitis. Uh, stands for anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. And it's got two types, C ANCA and P ANCA. So the ones that you need to know is uh, Wegener's and microscopic polyangitis. So Wegener, um, the way I remember it is Wegener is kind of like Wagner, the like classical composer. Um, so C for classical. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, people have actually kind of moved away from calling it Wegener's granulomatosis because apparently it was a Nazi. So it's now referred to as granulomatosis with polyangitis. So it kind of doesn't work anymore. Um, but you've also got microscopic polyangitis, which is the other one to know. Um, don't worry too much about Cherig Strauss syndrome. Um, so here you, you just remember P for polyangitis um, and you've got your microscopic polyangitis. So rapidly progressive or crescentic GN is um, a clinical syndrome. So again, with all the syndromes, it's a way of uh, a patient will present, uh, characterized by really rapid progressive loss of kidney function. And it occurs with all the um, nephritic, it can occur with all the nephritic syndromes. Um, they don't necessarily have rapidly progressive GN. Um, and it's due to 
um, heavy damage to the glomerular filtration barrier. So not only do you have like red blood cells and proteins leaking through, you also get um, your like inflammatory cells and your inflammatory mediators um, leaking through. And so they can like induce fibrin deposition. So you get all this stuff building up in Bowman's capsule and that forms a crescent. Okay, so uh, the next uh, thing to know is uh, UTIs. So UTIs, um, the only bug that you need to know that causes it is E. coli. Um, and the risk factors for UTIs are um, ab anatomical abnormalities. So um, particularly females, they have shorter urethra than men. So um, the bugs can get in up the urethra into the bladder and cause urinary tract infections. Whereas males generally don't have UTIs unless there's some underlying uh, problem, um, such as stasis of urine. So um, men with benign prostatic hyperplasia, um, they have urine um, build up in the bladder and that can predispose to UTIs. And the way UTIs will present is with your irritative symptoms. So irritative symptoms are fun, F-U-N, uh, frequency, urgency and nocturia. You can also get dys dysuria, painful urination, uh, suprapubic pain, which can spread up to the flanks, and that's known as pyelonephritis when you have flank pain, and that's when the infection has uh, travelled up the ureters into the kidneys. And generally with pyelonephritis, you'll see more systemic features as well, such as uh, fevers, nausea, vomiting, um, shakes, chills, and so on. The way that you treat UTI is with... Um, trimethoprene, that's the only one you need to know. Um, and the way that you investigate for a UTI is with urinalysis. So on urinalysis, you see, urinalysis, you'll see leukocytes, nitrites, and maybe some blood. And to do further testing, you would take a midstream urine sample and do microscopy, culture, and sensitivity on that. <clears throat> so the way that you can avoid UTIs is by drinking a lot of water, peeing regularly, um, having good personal hygiene, uh, post-intercourse void, as well as apparently cranberry juice. Okay, so um, just a bit of clinical skills to finish up. Um, so last year we actually had an OSCE where we had to perform urinalysis. So it's good to know um, what to look for when you're doing a urinalysis and also uh, being able to dip the stick in urine because uh, some people have spilt the urine in the past. Um, so what you see on urinalysis is glucose, which normally is absent, but you might see it in diabetes. Uh, bilirubin, also absent, um, but you might see in obstructive jaundice, ketones, you might see in DKA or starvation. Uh, specific gravity, don't worry too much about that. Um, just remember the, the normal range. Uh, blood, you don't normally see. Uh, it can be due to contamination during menstruation, um, but it might indicate things like uh, UTIs, stones, uh, potentially malignancies or nephritic syndrome. Um, and the other ones to know are your pH, um, know the normal range, um, the pro uh, protein. So if you see protein in your urine, you're thinking uh, perhaps a nephrotic syndrome, but that's, remember, caused by heavy proteinuria. Urobilinogen occurs with hemolytic jaundice. Um, nitrites, normally absent, but you'll see them in UTIs. And leukocytes are normally absent, but you'll see them in some form of UTI as well. So to finish up, um, just got a few questions. So a 67-year-old woman with congenital polycystic kidney disease falls and breaks her hip. She's found by the cleaner two days later in a severely dehydrated state. She's taken to hospital where she's, she's found to have acute renal failure. Which of the following is the most likely finding? Yeah, so I'm seeing people doing this. So asterixis, good. So um, Dupagen's contracture, that's uh, chronic liver disease. Um, ecchymosis, that's bruising. Harrison sulcus, that's um, asthma. Okay, so what is characteristic of glomerulonephritis? Uh, white blood cells, 100, proteins, plus plus, urate crystals, highline casts, or red blood cell casts? Yep, so red blood cell casts, good. Um, casts are these things that form in the tubules due to stasis, 
and that can occur when um, you get blood leaking through the glomerular filtration barrier and it kind of clumps together in the tubules and then as a result you get formation of these casts in your urine. So Margie has a blood pressure of 110 on 75 whilst lying down. Upon standing she shows postural hypotension. Which one of the following blood pressure readings would be consistent with that? Any takers? A? Oh my God. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so um, I forgot to highlight the right one, and I seem to have changed the values. Uh, anyway, so it's important to know the definition for postural hypertension. Um, so that's a drop in systolic blood pressure by more than 20, or a drop in diastolic blood pressure by more than 10 when standing up. And what does postural hypertension indicate? So it indicates um, hypovolemia, or it can also indicate um, autonomic neuropathy. Um, so it's just generally um, some problem with uh, your like baroreceptors receptors and um, regulating your blood pressure as you move about. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's 90 on 65. Okay. Um, an 85-year-old woman, otherwise healthy, presents with hypertension, hematuria. She has a family history of renal fa failure. CT shows enlarged kidneys. What is the most likely diagnosis? <coughs> so I'm hearing uh, polycystic kidney disease. Yep. Okay, um, so what is not associated with nephrotic syndrome? Uh, greater than 3.5 grams of proteinuria, edema, hyperlipidemia, hyponatremia, hypoalbuminemia. Anyone? D? Yep, good, hyponatremia. Okay, um, so I think that's the end. Um, Thanks everyone for coming. Um, sorry about all the confusion with the acid base questions. Yeah, so sorry about all the confusion with the acid base questions. Um, I'll update the slides and put in some proper ones. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions about kidney stuff or you have any questions about year two or year three, feel free to talk to me. Thank you. Thanks. Um, do I just like what I do here? Stop broadcasting. I think just stop broadcasting. Okay. And then, Two viewers. Nice. Yeah, and then uh, Kevchi said.